Hey friends, my name's Steve Guttenberg. The guy here, he's Mark. Hi. He lives in the village in New I'm York City. I'm here in the West Village in New York City. Yeah. And, you know, I've known Mark at least 10 years. You have a yeah. mutual friend. And, uh, and the thing that's interesting about this video compared to all the other videos is that you're usually on the other side of this. That's... You record sound for, for movies and and TV and stuff? I do, yeah, yeah. Ba ba well, basically, I'm non-union, uh -huh. so I don't do big television shows or feature films, and not really interested in that either, um, which some people can't quite understand. I would make probably twice as much money as I make now, but those sort of things, the big, big huge feature films uh -huh. and episodic television shows, it's a life, it's a time suck. It's like, basically, you could yeah, work... It's months, right? Months, 12 to 15 hour days, five days a week, and you don't have a life, and... Yeah. I like to enjoy life. So oh, so are you. There's so many other things, ven ven uh, venues to work in. I mean, documentary film is probably half of what I do. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's more fascinating than feature film. With a feature film, one hand, you're working with actors and watching them do their craft. And I've done some short films, and I did one indie feature. And I've worked with a lot of famous actors doing sort of EBK stuff where I've met a lot of actors. Um, but with documentary, it's happening in front of you and a documentary can be two things it can be sit down interviews which can be really fascinating i mean tony blair for instance not like i'm a fan of tony blair but fascinating to sit down mm. my mic is over and also on tony blair and it, it, you know i've had you know experiences like that i've been from prisons to mansions and everything in between that nobody's incredibly famous people presidents you name it right yeah um well but by the so way, documentary is just more. But, it's happening but you're, now. But you're you know? you're an audiophile. I well, okay. It's so funny. <laughs> this is what I <laughs> Wait said. A you're an engineer, Audio recording engineer. That's an audiophile. That's I don't understand. Why do you think it is that that relatively few recording engineers? So you think their their thing is sound, right? That they would be, you know, a lot of them would be audiophiles, and yet very few, right? Why? Why is it that there's? Because you know you have many friends that are recording engineers, right? So I I do, and most are not. Well, there's several things I could theorize, and again, there's location sound people like myself, right. and then there's music engineers. Music. Right. Okay. I've done a little bit, but I wouldn't say but that's. You share a thing. common thing that you record sound. You you probably yeah. are into sound. So what's what's the disconnect? Why aren't more engineers audio files? Well, I wonder with some music engineers, I wonder if you're in the studio listening to music all day so much, do you get burnt out on that? And you don't want to listen in your off time so much? Also, it's a money thing, too. Some of the engineers I know, there's a couple I know, have their own studio spaces, and that's where their money goes. It okay. goes back okay. in the studio. Right. So in the end, they're like, you know what? My studio is my listening room. Okay. Awesome. That's fair. But the audiophile bugs sort of got with me first before I became a sound person. I didn't have a lot of money at that time, but I managed to buy a pair of B&W uh, 602s or 3s, I forget which. Um, I had this uh, 70s uh, Harman Kardon receiver that was not, not bad, it was okay. I got a Rotel CD player. Um, I had a dual turntable that eventually upgraded to Riga Planar 3. So before I became a location sound person, I started getting into the audiophile thing. Um, and then when I was like, you know, I'm working these stupid office jobs, I really should get into production. And I'm glad I did. I got to work with a couple of my favorite artists, David Bowie and Mercury nice. Rev. But Bowie was like, <laughs> that's, yeah, that's, that's definitely like what, a, what, a favorite What job. album period? Was this it? was nine, 2000, 2000. Um, I'm trying to remember the name. Tin Machine? Or that Tim Machine was more late eighties and then early nineties. Oh, really? Tim oh, Machine. Okay. He it was a song called "The Pretty Things Have Gone to Hell," right? Okay. And what's fascinating about it was that um, Henson Studios built five life-size Bowie puppets oh. of five different Bowie periods. There was oh, Hunky wow. Dory dress, uh, Ziggy Stardust, um, Aladdin Sane, the Thin White Duke, and then there was Bowie. So anyways, they had these five life-size Bowie mannequins, um, including one that could, the Thin White Duke could smoke, actually. And they had one as Bowie as he looked then at that period, about 2000. And basically, they were chasing him all around. It was his past chasing oh. him. And in the end, they captured him, and he became a mannequin as he 
looked okay. at the time in 2000. That stuff they shot the day before. There was no playback. So, so they had the mannequins in the Kit Kat Theater, which is now gone. And I was there to do playback and also record a little dialogue thing of Bowie talking to his band. Mm -hmm. And um, so anyways, um, did playback the song, but got to record Bowie doing a little patter with his band, so to speak. And then the assistant director says, do you think we should get the lines wild also? And we really had it clean, but I wanted a little more time with Bowie. So it's like, yeah, we should get his lines wild also. Mm -hmm. So I go down to the basement of the club with Bowie and I'm sitting there right next to him looking at those two colored eyes with the chef's microphone pointed at his mouth. And I'm just like, this is like my high school yeah. and college idol sitting right here. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, awesome. okay, yeah, well, if David could do the lines. Okay, that's good, we got it. <laughs> That was a favorite experience. I bet. Um, this is a company, Inner Sound, uh, that used to exist. It's an electrostatic transmission line woofer hybrid. Oh, I didn't know that. And then here like is, that. this is the transmission line woofer. Uh-huh. It's a 10 inch, uh, 10 foot long, rather, 10 foot long transmission line folded up in the cabinet here. Okay. A light paper cone woofer by, I can never, I never know if it's Seas or Seas, S-E-A-S, the speaker I company. think it's Seas, but Seas. let's go for that. So it's a Seas, it's a Seas woofer, right? Mm -hmm. And so part of the problem with the electrostatic panel is to try to get a dynamic driver to mesh in with it. It doesn't always work very well. That was a problem with some of the earlier Martin Logans. You could almost hear the woofer as a separate entity um, because it doesn't react as quickly as a membrane that's as thin as a human hair or even thinner. So Roger Sanders' idea was to find a very light, responsive woofer, a paper cone, and put it in a transmission line. And then he could tune it to react very quickly. What's the crossover? Then the crossover, it's interesting, there's an electronic crossover, which is down here. This is a crossover amp. It's a bi-amp system. Okay. This, this is a 300 watt per channel, at eight ohms amplifier mm -hmm. that basically drives the transmission line, 10 inch woofer here. And there's an electronic crossover in there. The crossover point is, it's, it's interesting because it's in the mid range. It's about 330 Hertz, I believe. Mm -hmm. But with the electronic crossover, it's, it's pretty seamless. It's, it really sounds of one of a piece. And a friend of mine who worked for Inner Sound actually went to some dealers who were skeptical until they would bring out their torture disc and they would play the system and they'd be like, you're right, it is a seamless integration of the woofer and the panel. Mm. So there's real bass for the speaker, real dynamic bass, which is hard to get out of. Did you say sets. the actual model number? The, okay, well, this is an interesting, funny, funny hybrid. This was the first generation, the ESL Mark One, the... the um, Eros. Eros is the model, sorry. This is the Eros Mark I. However, these are the Mark III panels. Basically, these are the arc-proof panels. I had a friend who worked for Intersound. Um, I found these used in New Hampshire for a really good price. And with the first version of Crossover Amp, which basically was garbage, um, I managed to sell it cheap to somebody. I don't know what they were going to do with it, <laughs> but they bought it. Um, so basically, through my friend Wes, I was able to buy the, the newer panels, and these are arc-proof, basically. You can spray water on these. <laughs> Dust can like get on plant. them. Roger Sanders used to suppose it shows would take a misting bottle and mist the speaker while it was playing, nice. and basically be like, try that with another electrostat. And also, it's a negative charge, I think, of both sides, so the dust gets repelled onto the surface um, here rather than on the mylar. Hmm. And then you just kind of, I just vacuum this off like once a month or so. So you can play these at high volume level. They won't arc. Um, smoke won't bother them. If you, you know, happen to smoke, dust won't bother them. Humidity won't bother them at all. Although I've noticed really, really humid days, the system sounds a little darker. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's just us. It, it could be anything, but it could be, I don't know if it's the panels either. So electrostatic panel here. So this is the Eros Mark I speaker, but with the Mark III panel. Right. Um, and Let's then the, move on. And so we'll move on. We'll go into, I'll put this back here. So basically, we're going to go backwards. We're going to go through the two amplifiers. This is the crossover amplifier. This has an electronic crossover in it. 
The crossover point is at 330 Hz, though he now, Roger Sanders, now uses a Behringer digital crossover amp, and using that, he's able to drop it down to 200 Hz. So why don't you get that? I may get it. What I may do, he, he sells the unit, basically he sells unit, he, he mods it, he disconnects the fan, and changes, I think, the XLRs for RCAs. I could probably do that myself. I do some soldering and, and, and whatnot. So I may buy the unit and try it knowing I can return it if it doesn't work out well. No, well, the one negative, you're digitizing your your, your, your oh. signal. Oh, I'm not, I don't like that. Don't do that. It, it's Because it, <laughs> the only way to do this, it's yeah. a digital crossover. Of course, yeah. But I've heard it at shows, mm -hmm. and I'm like, yes, it does sound a little more transparent than my system because you're, you're, you're bringing right. more mid-range through the right. panel. Right. So you know what? You can buy one of these for like 450 bucks, I think, right? Mm, I could try it. If, if, if it's not better, I just return it. So, okay. But I'm too lazy. I haven't gotten around to it. With this, I've actually changed. There's op amps in here, right? Mm -hmm. I put audiophile grade op amps in it. Um, Roger Sanders doesn't believe that any op amps sound different. He's like, they're all the, they're all the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My friend Paul, who's now deceased, he had gotten into op amps, and he did some research, and we tried... A couple different op amps and yes I think the op amps totally improve the sound swapping swapping them out for better op amps so with the crossover amp it's and it's a power, powerful amp it's so it's an amp and a crossover all in amp and crossover all in one mm -hmm. and basically you can you can raise or lower um, 100 Hertz or below for bass from steps 1 through 12 I'm um, actually between 3 and 4 um, I find bass gets very accentuated in this area and I'm also sitting close to the rear wall which accentuates the bass mm. and also neighbors we've worked out times of oh, nice. <laughs> what you know volume levels and everything like that oh, we've had some thumping through the wall kind of thing life in New York City and I'm like oh no it's too loud so we worked that out and also I've, I've gotten into headphones at night too which we can go over that too mm. then over here you'll see down here what looks like the same amp minus the controls and it is the same amplifier that's in there. It's the ESL amp, it's called. It's a design that Nelson Pass came up with, but never implemented. It's an AB amp, class AB amp, that is designed to drive electrostatics in difficult loads. And the way it works is, I can actually take the cover off if you, if you want to. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> I was gonna show the transistor stuff. But basically the way it works is, there's 18 transistors per side, right? So the amp is idling most of the time, like even if you're abusing mm. it, so to speak. And like I said, it'll work almost into a dead short. Like people have used these to drive sound labs, um, magda pans, um, um, Apache ribbons, you know, yeah. which Apache ribbons are difficult yeah. to drive. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a gutsy gutsy amp. And it really doesn't run hot or anything like that. It stays on 24 seven, it idles at three watts. Basically, the recommendation was leave the amps on all the time. Most things die with power up, power surges. So, and a lot of recording studios leave their equipment on 24 mm. seven. So anyways, it's a great sounding amp. I had different amps with these before. I had Monarchy amps, I don't know if everybody knows yeah. them. Yeah. The, the Monarchies were nice. They were, they were only 100 watts per, per channel, class A. Um, I was convinced to get this amp you know, by a friend who worked for Intersound, and I'm glad he convinced me because I was like, oh, these monarchy amps sound pretty good, actually. Now, when I plugged this in, the panels came alive. The turntable, boy, okay, what it is, it's hard to say It's if it's a red point or a Galibier or both. Basically what happened, I'll try to make this as brief as possible. <laughs> Back in the late 90s, um, there was the first acrylic turntable that came around. I might have been clear audio, if I'm mm -hmm. not kind of sure, right? So there was this vinyl list. I can't remember if it was the Joe list or which list it was, but basically there was this group of people who were saying, we could probably make our own turntable, maybe make it even better. And so one of the members of the group, um, I can't remember his name now. I think his name was Terry. He said, I have a brother or brother-in-law rather who's a machinist. He can machine acrylic platters for us. So basically the Terrace 10, the company was called Terrace. What well, became a company. These original 10 people had 10 platters made 
and each of them came up with their own like plinth designs, mm -hmm. right? And and then they kind of settled on silk thread as a design, using silk thread and started experimenting with motors. What happened is the main guy who had the, the his brother-in-law make up the uh, acrylic platters took everybody's knowledge they had pulled together and ran with it as a company called Terres, T-E-R-E-S. So much to the chagrin of the other nine people <laughs> who were not in on this deal, right? So two of the two of the guys, Peter Clark and Tom Macaris, basically were like, let's build a turntable better than his. And they joined forces and called the company Redpoint. And basically they were like, okay, acrylic's not the answer. So they started experimenting with PVC. And this, this platter is PVC. Um, it also has, important to note, there's 24 chambers filled with lead shot and oil in the platter here. It weighs 24 pounds, the platter itself. Mm -hmm. The whole idea, it's a high mass design. Ba basically, you got what, two turntable designs. You get suspended, which will use air bladders or springs for vibration isolation, or you go with the mass, the actual mass of the turntable, along with damping materials and whatnot to try to kill external vibrations as well as the vibrations the turntable itself creates mm, sure. from the motor, from the spinning of the platter, you know, all kinds of, you know, things of that sort. I got this for a great price um, many years ago. It would cost a lot more. I don't know what this would cost now as an equivalent. It's a 44 pound base. This is MDF, but filled with lead shot. And then it's, it's an aluminum top plate with heat sink so it won't ring. And then the motor pod is like eight or nine pounds. Um, uses either half inch recording tape or in this case mylar ribbon which is a little thinner than recording tape it, it may sound better I'm um, still trying to figure that out and then there's a six pound weight that goes yeah. on top it's filled with lead shot aye, aye. and that couples the record to the platter um, although there's some other record weights I may try I'm not sure for now, this is still working fine, but there's HRS systems. There was one designed for red point tables. It's lighter than this, but supposedly sounds better. It's like about four or $500. I may try one at some point, but for now I'm sticking with the tried and true. The arm is a triplanar. Oh. Um, Mark seven, I think. I think well, I'm, I, I have a question. You know, yes. Does your wife play this system? Um, she enjoys it when it's playing. Uh -huh. She wa we watch films together through it, uh -huh. and and series, mm -hmm. and um, she likes it when I'm playing music. And she knows how to you know hook up the phone and play things you know. And we'll listen to NPR through the system too and stuff like that. But she doesn't on her own usually. She'll she'll turn it on if I'm not around and she's watching you know a film or series. Uh -huh. She'll fire up the system and oh, okay. and you know yeah. so but. If I'm, she, she won't play music on her own, but she likes music. We go to shows sometimes, and if I'm home, I'm like, do you want to hear something? And she has certain artists she really likes. You know, yes, we put Radiohead on or something like that. And and she'll enjoy the music when I'm playing it. But on her on her own, she doesn't seek it out, if that makes no, any sense. No, it's very common. But she appreciates it. Like, like there was no, no, you can't do this, or I don't want this in the house, or any. Oh, that's great. Yeah, no, no, because I heard some men, oh, my wife, I can't do this or that. I'm like, oh, I'm okay, you know. Yeah, good. So, good so it's, it's good. So with you're that. into headphones. So, uh, what is this? Yeah. What is this? Wait, oh, okay. This needs to be repaired. Oh. In fact, this happened also. The, there's the, uh, uh -oh. the parts to fix that. Yeah. This is a Hagerman trumpet. It's a phono stage. It's a fantastic sounding phono stage. Wow. He has a different version now. The, the, the version now, it's the like the trumpet two, and it actually has two phono stages in one, so you can have two tone arms hooked up at the same wow. time if you choose. Let's talk about excess. And he changed design a, a little bit from this. The problem is this was shipped to me, not packed in the best manner, and it worked gloriously for about two hours, and, oh. then, and then I got a power supply problem. It sounded totally different than this phono stage, which is also a line stage. This is the, the Convergent Audio Technology, uh -huh. also known as CAT. Yeah, well, that's a full preamp. Yeah, so what, it is. But what's funny is, for years, I ran both digital and analog through it, right? Mm. I found it's a great phono stage. I prefer my digital straight into the system. What are those feet? 
the feet. Oh, these are just rubber balls. I have to admit, the idea wasn't mine originally. There's a guy, Vin Vu, has a company, Ginkgo Audio. Mm -hmm. And he does a system with rubber balls and, and, and uh, plexiglass like platforms. Mm -hmm. And so I had, a, I had a top for this too. And then some friends were over and we took the top out and put it just on the rubber balls, which, you know, offers, you know, isolation. Mm -hmm. And we all thought it sounded better actually just on the rubber balls than on the, the uh, plexiglass platform. Cool. But that's another thing I'm thinking about experimenting with is I've been using tubes for phono stage for years. And I know there's some people who prefer solid state for phono stage, mm -hmm. actually. And I've started to hear some at shows and stuff where I'm like, that sounds really good. Not a tube there. And boy, it sounds good. Um, I might be getting a Brooklyn deck plus at some oh, point. Well, that's not a phono. I mean, it has, it has a phono stage. But don't, don't, in other words, don't judge your solid state a, phono it's stage. It's a chip or something. It's not a phono stage. Well, yeah. probably I figure it's probably at least, what, two to four grand to get a good solid state phono stage. Headphones. So headphones. Oh, the, so this is the burst. And I'm also using this as a preamp in the system and the DAC. Mm -hmm. But eventually, I'm probably going to go for Brooklyn DAC plus because I think it's a better DAC. Yeah. And it's a good headphone amp too, and it's balanced. But maybe I'll, I don't maybe know, if I'll sell the person this and as keep a headphone it. Amp and use the Brooklyn as a DAC. That's what I'm thinking. That's what I'm thinking because it's a great headphone amp. It's Class A, four watts. Um, and I found with the Mr. Speaker's headphones that I use, I do like it in the four watt yeah, output. No, yeah, definitely. And it's it's a great. It's hot, but not too hot. Um, I really like it. The one complaint, this is the Burson conductor. It's basically the Burson soloist, but with a DAC added. And they're already in version three. I think this is version two, or maybe they're in version four at this point. And some people have said they thought, at least with this version, they thought the headphone gramp amp was great. I remember Dan Clark saying it from the speaker. He's like, soloist, great headphone amp. But he thought, he thought that with the conductor, the DAC is where they didn't quite hit it. Mm -hmm. I think it's still a really good sounding DAC, but I think there's probably better DACs, whether it's a later version of Burson or maybe, I've heard the Brooklyn DAC Plus, I like it. Well. So um, headphones are something that I've gotten into over the last few years, and I find that it's its own world. I enjoy it as much as listening to a pair of speakers in a room. It's a different experience. Some people don't like headphones in place of speakers. Um, I think it's partly because I wear headphones so much for my work as a location, right. uh, you know, audio engineer that I'm used to wearing headphones. And initially, um, when the high-end high headphone thing first started and I was listening, I'm like, I'm like, oh, there's some good headphones. I could sort of get into this, but not as much as listening to speakers in a room. I remember even hearing some earlier amp design where they did um, some phase tricks to try to make it sound like you're listening to speakers right. in a room. And it just sounded phasey and weird. <laughs> in any way, it sounded like speakers in a room. And then something happened where headphones started growing in popularity. And then there were headphone shows. And I started listening more. And there were more designs and better designs. And I started getting into headphones. And I've always told people, if, if you want to get into audiophile sound, but you don't have a lot of money, you could start with a good pair of headphones. Like you could spend a few hundred bucks and get something that might be equivalent to like a 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 right. pair of speakers or more, you, you know? The, the transducers are by your ears, the room's taken out of the equation, everything's smaller, costs less to, to make. Um, because I started listening to headphones more and I'm like, I'm hearing things that I'm hearing in $5,000, $10,000 speakers and stuff like that. So I really got the headphones and I like it as much as listening to a stereo system. It's a different thing. Yeah. Yeah. So then it's a question of at home or portable. And do you want portable or home to start with? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, for portable, right? Pardon the tape. I dropped it and the, the front plate comes off a little bit. I've, this company, Centrance. Yeah, yeah, I know them. I like Centrance stuff. I've, I've had a couple things by them. And this is, actually, he's replacing this. He, that's that one, one problem with Centrance is he's constantly, constantly upgrading things and discontinuing things. Mm -hmm. So he's coming up with this ultimate headphone amp. But this is called the Blue DAC. It's 400 bucks. Yeah, it's a Bluetooth. It's blue. Well, here's the funny thing with this is for the longest time, I cabled to it, right? Mm -hmm. Because I'm like, well, Bluetooth can't be as good and everything like that. And 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 this will do like high res and everything like that right and then one day i had a problem i either shorting cable or something like that it kept kicking it off i got annoyed so i'm like let me try the bluetooth and the first time i tried the bluetooth i didn't realize i had the volume down on the phone 
So I'm like, oh, the signal's not as loud. Duh, I put the volume up away in the phone. The Bluetooth in this sounds really damn good. I don't bother with the cable anymore, unless I'm like, gee, it's a high-res file, I wanna hear it that way. The, it's, it's really good sounding Bluetooth. It really mm -hmm. shocked me. I'm like, and now I use Bluetooth for this all the time with an nice. iPhone. Cool. And it sounds good. And then for, I have various headphones. I like this one company, Periodic Audio. Mm -hmm. And actually I have the Beryllium Bees I'm gonna sell. These are the Carbons, unless I keep the Bees too, because they sound different. They look kind of cheap and chintzy if you look at right. them, right? But the whole idea is they put the money into the drivers and right. the design. And the beryllium's that they make, they, those are $300, the beryllium's. Use a beryllium driver, their first earbud to use beryllium's. Fantastic. These are carbon, so it's a diamond basically that's grown. Um, these are $400. Is it better than the beryllium? Well, it, I don't know. It's different. The beryllium, the mid-range is better. With this though, the highs and the bottom are are better. It's a choose your poison, different sound. They're both quite fantastic earbuds, but I, I find that, um, inner ear monitors we should say, um, I find that um, music that's percussive especially sounds even better with the carbons than with the beryllium ones, the bees, as they're mm. called. And so then I have what I use for at home or occasionally, well, I'll show what I use for traveling, Mr. Speakers, Dan Clark. Yeah. Now it's Dan Clark Audio. What a, what a crazy idea. He He's changed, changed the, the name. Oh. In fact, these I may sell to get, these, these are the Eons. Yeah. These are my closed back ones, but now there's the Eon 2s. Uh -huh. And the claim is that the, the Eon 2s, first of all, it's interesting, it folds yeah, 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 I saw, I saw. But supposedly, sonically, they start comparing to the ether, the upper inline. Uh -huh. So I'm debating, and you know how it is, I'll lose money like selling these, right? Do I sell these cheap, like 350 bucks, whatever, to buy them? Right. I'm yeah. not sure yet, but maybe. These are great, though. These were like, I think, 800 when they were new, right? Yeah, I remember those. Great, great seal, by the way. And I've had other, I've, I've gone back to the very beginning with him. I had Mad Dogs, yeah, yeah. which is this basically Fostex modified. Right. Then I had the Alpha Primes. But then I went to the Ether. These the Ether Flows, rather. Right. Ether Flow Open, Open mm -hmm. Back, mm -hmm. right? Um, open Back headphones were a newer thing to me a few years ago when I heard them. I knew that it existed. And I was sort of like, well, why would you want that? Because sound's gonna bleed in and out. They must sound different. And then of course reading, yes, they sound more open, duh. It's kind of like a panel speaker, like what I have you know, right. here, right? Similar concept. So anyways, these are the ether flows. I heard the closed version first, which was really good. But then I heard the open and I was like, no contest. But you know what? If I had more money, I'd have Odysseys too. I, because there's no one thing I've heard just like, if I was rich, I'd, I'd have like a dozen different speakers. Right. Well, maybe I wouldn't. I don't know. But, but. Oh, I would. But I. Because they, they're, they're different. They're flawed, too. They're flawed one way or another. Ooh, and, I want to hear this on this. I want to hear this on yeah, that. That's, that's the thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or we know we've heard system. Again, and I've gotten the conversations and arguments with people about this. And I used to be the accuracy is what's important camp. I used to be, a, when I first started, started getting into this, and then when I heard quad 57s and I heard that mid-range right of the quad and everything and then I got into electrostats it all came about detail and accuracy detail and accuracy right and then I heard some systems that were colored and maybe not accurate but I had to admit they were fun to listen to they were involving right so now I don't necessarily have any one set philosophy I, I like the idea of detail and accuracy but sometimes things can be colored and fun sounding and that can be more enjoyable if you're in the mood for I that. Think, I think so. And I think that's a good place to end. There we go. <laughs> fun, fun. <laughs> fun versus accurate. I'm, I'm in the fun side. I'm, I'm moving more that where I, I sit in right in the middle. I'm, I'm like this yeah. tattoo. I'm yin, yin and yang. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that sums me up perfectly. I'm a total, uh, <clears throat> I'm a hypocrite. No, I'm, I'm uh, a duality yeah, person. That's what you're having. That's the best. I, Try to. You've achieved it. You've achieved the ultimate. I have. I think so, because you're having a good time. That's I, yes, I think I think I agonize about certain things in the past that I kind of. You're just naturally a happy person.
Yeah. Oh, I, yeah, I got my, I got my sad side or I my know. angry I, side I, I too. I've never seen that. I only see the happy, the happy no. Mark. Well, guys, uh, my name is Steve Guttenberg. This is my friend Mark. <laughs> happy Mark. Sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I, most of the time. And uh, yes, maybe I'm a little. Uh, this this is the Audiophiliac Daily Show coming to you from Mark's apartment. This has been a blast. Um, we may see more from Mark in the future on the Audio <laughs> Daily Show. You're warning them. Yeah, I'm warning you. Yeah, keep your <sighs> keep your powder dry. So, uh, hey, if you like what I do, please come back often. Like these videos, yes. share them. Uh, follow me on Twitter at Audiophiliac Man. You can follow me on Instagram at Steve Guttenberg. And uh, I think we are finally at the end of this ep- extended episode. So thank you, Mark. See you later, guys. Ciao. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.